G'day, how you going? Welcome to Bootlosophy, my name is Tech. I'd like to acknowledge the Wajuk people of Noongar Buja, whose country I live and work on. Today, I'm going to review this pair of Truman boots in Charles F. Stead's Black Rambler leather. This is Truman Boots' standard cap toe design on their 79 last. To my mind, it looks designed more to look like an American heritage style work boot rather than a military-like service boot. Now, to be honest, there's no real definition of what splits the two styles of boots. There are some very clear service boot designs such as the White's MP, the uh, Viberg service boot, Thursday's Captain, uh, and most of Parkhurst's offerings. On the other hand, there are also some clear heritage work boot designs uh, like the Pacific Northwest work boots and the iconic, uh, the iconic Red Wing Iron Ranger, which was after all derived from miners boots. However, some of the more modern brands do tend to blend service boots with uh, dress boots and work boots. And for nothing else other than chunk and heartiness, I'm calling this a work boot rather than a service boot. The aesthetics is definitely rugged casual, especially in this leather and in most of Truman's leather offerings. Definitely not for shining up on the parade ground. Its shaft is a little over 5 inches from the top of the heel to the collar. Uh, the last is a wide-fitting, comfortable last. Uh, it has a, a stubby cap toe, open derby lacing a, and a solid block heel. The black Rambler leather is matte. Uh, and looks solid and sturdy in this colorway. Amongst all of my Truman boots, and I have five, including the Java Wax Flash that I've already reviewed, you can check it out here, uh, these look most like duck feet <laughs> in the last that opens out uh, at the ball of the feet. I think that's mostly because of the contrast of the natural color welt and the white stitching against the uh, solid black uppers. It frames and emphasizes the curve of the toe box, which all tends to mean that you can more or less only wear these boots in a rugged casual outfit. Think jeans and t-shirts or rugged flannels and outdoorsy jackets, uh, or else think more like workwear in jeans of uh, various colors, including tan, uh, and khaki uh, pants or earth-colored work shirts. Uh, the kind of scenarios you'd wear these boots would be, say, out hiking, uh, working outdoors or in your garage or workshop, very casual afternoons at the pub and uh, uh, you know eating hamburgers rather than eating French silver service dinners. I have worn them to the office under a very casual, business casual outfit, but I'm not sure that looks entirely works. Uh, this matte rub rambler uh, leather kind of softens it too much and with the uh, black on the natural welt. Yeah, look, I think definitely more on the denim side of things. Okay, before I go on to walk through the construction of these boots, let's take a look at Truman Boots, the company. Truman is named after the owner's Border Collie. Uh, that's the dog you see in their brand logo. Truman isn't an old-time boot company, even if their products look like they came from a 100-year-old tradition. In fact, it was founded in 2014 by Vince Romano, and it was first based in Pennsylvania, which for non-Americans is in the eastern United States. Realizing that Pennsylvania perhaps didn't have the skilled labor for hand-making boots in the volume that it was growing into, they moved to Boulder in Colorado, which is uh, sort of in the Midwest of the US. A and when they then outgrew the economic support of Colorado, they moved to Oregon in the Pacific Northwest. That's actually a very peripatetic journey in six or seven years. Now, Truman is a small batch made-to-order company that's focused on making a well-made American product. And in doing so, by happenstance, they are reviving an industry that could have disappeared in the US. Now, I guess if I were American and knowing heritage bootmaking skills were disappearing, for that reason alone, I'd go some way towards supporting them. Now, looking at the design of their boots, they're clearly influenced by American heritage workwear. Romana has said that when he started Truman Boots, he set out to make boots that would be unique and last for many years. 
uh, the boots they now produce are definitely rugged and tough and the use of very unique and different leathers make whatever they offer on their lasts really unique. And so on to the construction of these boots. As usual, I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way upwards. Starting at the bottom of this pair are outsoles from Daynight from the United Kingdom. Daynight is a product of the Harbour Rubber Company based in uh, Leeds in the United Kingdom and they're famous for their ubiquitous studded low profile outsole that are used or copied <laughs> by almost every boot ma maker you can name, uh, whether they're big or small. They've been around since 1894, so they're not new kids on the block. And the name Day Night comes from their reputation of running their mills or factories day and night. They're made from non-abrasive natural rubber with very little or no carbon. So it's non-marking and has more give and is less prone to tearing than carbon rich hard rubber compounds. The uh, little studs provide good grip over most surfaces. Although I have found that uh, wet smooth pavers on driveways and such can be a little challenging. <laughs> um, they do provide a low profile, which means for dressier boots, not these, uh, you can get away with them as a dressy sole. They're attached to the uppers using a 360 degree Goodyear welt construction. Check out the details of Goodyear welting in my video up here. But basically, there's a strip of leather called the welt, which goes all the way around the circumference of the boot, hence called 360 degrees. And the welt is stitched to the uppers on the inside, while stitched through the midsole and outsole on the outside. The two stated advantages of Goodyear welted boots are that they are uh, water resistant because no stitch holes go all the way through from the inside to the outside of the outsole. And number two is that they are easily resold by cutting the uh, outside stitches, peeling off the outsole, and then gluing and restitching a new outsole on. In this case, this is a storm welt. A storm welt is where the leather welt is carved so that it has a ridge in the center of the upper side. The raised ridge gets pushed up against the uppers so that when it's sewn on, it forms an extra raised barrier against moisture. Now for interest's sake, I hope you're interested in this, a storm welt with this carved ridge is different from a split reverse welt where the welt is split halfway and the top half of the split is flanged up to make the, uh, this raised bit here. The way you can tell is that the raised part is cut leather, whereas in this storm welt, it's smooth and finished. Here's another interesting tidbit. I think the English call the split reverse welt a storm welt, while they call this a barber welt, because the carved welt is made by the Barber Welting Company. Just to add confusion to boot anatomy. Now the welting, it's a little uneven in these boots. While it's cleanly put together on uh, most of the way around the boot, that ridge kind of gets squashed under the arches and at the back of the heel almost disappears. I can't see it structural at all and I'm not sure it'll have any detrimental effect on water resistance to be honest. But I thought it was an interesting quirk of a handmade boot. Things are not uniform. The heel is stack leather with a day-night rubber top lift. The midsole is leather and glued and stitched so well to the welt that it's actually very hard to see the seam between the welt and the midsole. Inside the boot, the insole is leather, but I'm not sure if this has a cork or foam filler that fills in the cavity inside that's caused by the welt going all the way around the circumference. You just think of a thick leather welt going around, there's got to be a cavity inside. Truman's construction has moved from stitch down to Goodyear welting, and in doing so, their fillers have moved around between foam and cork. I believe all current models use cork, but I'm just not sure where in the Truman timeline of changing materials this particular pair falls into. There is a steel shank in the midsole. Uh, that's a piece of uh, flat steel that bridges the gap between the heel and the ball of the foot to support your arches from collapsing into that gap and causing uh, tired feet by the end of the day. And then, we're still inside, on top of all of that is a non-removable -rem uh, leather sock liner glued inside. There is no foam under this sock liner, so the foot 
settles immediately or, or contacts immediately uh, into the leather and cork or foam. <laughs> and it can feel quite, um, shall I say, solid underfoot. The uppers are lasted on Truman's 79 last. A last is the uh, foot-shaped mold that the bootmaker stretches the leather upper around, so forming the actual shape of the boot. The 79 last is Truman's most popular last and is either bought from a, uh, or licensed from a vintage last made by a Wisconsin US last making company. It has good width around the ball of the foot, uh, but not particularly high volume across the vamp or the instep. Uh, and it does have a comfortable round toe. The black Rambler leather is from Charles F. Stead, based in Leeds in England, and probably the most famous tanner of suede leathers. Rambler is a shrunken wax suede. The suede is shrunken in heat by as much as a third. This gives the fibres a really tight structure, which improves water resistance and of course durability. It's waxed in the tanning rather than like other wax suede, you know, like Waxy Commander, uh, that has wax applied on the surface after tanning. Obviously having lost 30% of a hide, it's more expensive than untreated suede. One of the most interesting effects of the shrinking is that there's a lot of texture on the outside. Uh, maybe not so noticeable in this black version, but in others, particularly lighter colours, you can see the veins and muscular markings brought out in relief and emphasised by that shrinking process. The result is a slightly dry, slightly waxy, matte feeling leather. Uh, and while pretty supple, it's firmer than unaltered suede. The upper's construction involves a toe cap with triple stitching. It's not a true toe cap, meaning the vamp stops at the stitch and the toe cap is sewn on, rather than the toe cap being sewn on top of a full length vamp. This pair has an unstructured toe box, and already you can see it's collapsing and losing its shape, which I find attractive, others may not. Uh, it's not uncomfortable because there's enough structure in the leather uh, not to feel it pushing down into the top of my toes, although I have other unstructured boots that I can feel that pressure. The two quarter pieces are generous and it has a single piece attractively waxy backstay that supports the shaft. There's an internal heel counter, but it's very light. Here again, I'm not sure if it's a leather heel counter or some type of leather board because Truman have used both at different times. There is a flexible give in it, so maybe it's leather. Uh, the boot is leather lined in the vamp and unlined in the shaft, but the heel counter, which I bet you can't see, it is covered inside by a suede patch. The brown contrast stitching is a very neat double and triple stitching along all the panels, and there's not a loose stitch uh, that I've seen so far. The tongue, is semi-gusseted up to the last of the five brass eyelets and above the eyelets are two brass speed hooks. All the hardware is nicely backed with grommets or washers so you don't get that scarring on your tongue. The speed hooks though are small, they don't stand up and out like say Iron Ranger speed hooks or even Grant Stone speed hooks which have that you know definite hook to them. They're small enough to almost look like the notched posts that you see in White's MPs for example. Uh, one complaint, being small, it really is quite difficult to hook the rawhide laces and sometimes when I'm in a hurry, I keep missing the top speed hook as I try to wrap the leather laces around the, uh, the shaft. So how do you take care of this Rambler leather? Well, first of all, if you follow my videos, you'll know to click on like and subscribe. <laughs> um, but more specifically, you know that I'm a big believer in just regular brushing of your boots with a good quality horsehair brush. Even on these matte, waxy suede leathers, uh, grit and sand is the enemy of leather, so it's important to regularly get rid of buildup. You know, I've never washed Rambler, but all of my research shows that washing with saddle soap is not a problem. Uh, unlike stock suede, which is quite nappy, you, you can't get that wet and sudsy, and it, they need more you know, like special suede shampoos. That's what my research says, but even so, if you decide to saddle soap this, uh, make sure you test on, say, the tongue, uh, where you can't see it if everything goes pear-shaped. As for conditioning, people have said that they use Venetian shoe cream, but I think that might be 
you know, that might have too much wax in the product and it may make the matte leather a little too shiny. I've used Big 4 on this successfully and it's actually come out quite good. The initial look was a bit wet, but after drying a few days and then getting solidly brushed, a lot of the sheen that was on there gets knocked off and the, the kind of rough nappiness starts to come through again. This Rambler shrunken suede is not a nappy suede anyway, so you don't get that nappy effect. You can check out links to some of these products in the description box below. Let's turn to look at sizing, fit and comfort. So to start with, I measure a US 8.5 in D width on the US Brannock device, so that's my true to size. For my Australian and other Commonwealth viewers, US size numbers are one down from UK size numbers. Uh, so that means my UK size, uh, true size is 7.5. However, in American heritage boot styles, most of them are built large, so I usually take a size 8 in US boots, US 8. So that's a UK 7. I find most UK and European boot makers actually stay true to size, but, well, we're talking about an American boot here. So I got these in a US 8 D. In that size, in this 79 last, the fit is pretty much perfect. I have a good thumb's width between the uh, tip of my toes and the tip of the boot uh, and there's practically no heel slip and my feet uh, and he uh, heels are held quite snugly. Uh, the heel is slightly bigger than, than my own heels but the waist is snug so that's fine and the width at the ball of the feet is really good giving me room but not too much room. Uh, despite the round toe though, the ball of the feet do crowd in quite quickly onto the tip of the toe box and my little toes do feel a little more snug than I usually like. Not a problem, uh, just conscious that you know, they're there. As for comfort, I think the phrase, I know I'm wearing a boot, is the right description. No, these are not as comfy as sneakers. They're not uncomfortable, but you know you have them on. Uh, the leather is supple, so that's a plus. The fitting is good, so that's definitely a plus. There's not a lot of shock absorption underfoot, so that's not a plus. Whether cork or foam plus thin day-night outsole on what is not a particularly thick leather midsole, this gives you a very firm tread under your feet. Again, it's not uncomfortable, but this is not the most comfy of all my boots. Some people like their boots to feel like boots. You like these. Some other people like to forget they're actually in the pair of boots. You won't in these. Okay, now to value. Uh, are these worth the price? What is the price? These are over a year old and you can't get this exact model today because Truman have moved on, as they are wont to do, uh, and changed construction and materials. But a similar boot in Rambler leather, lots of other colours of Rambler, they list at around 700 Australian dollars or on their website uh, list at uh, US 460 odd dollars. You know, mid 400 US dollars is pretty good for a boot built with this type of quality. Truman have had a history of some iffy quality control at times, but as I say, I have five pairs and apart from some very small issues, I haven't come across any QC issues. I certainly would be miffed if I paid over 400 US dollars and got a pair where the, uh, perhaps the heel wasn't nailed on properly or uh, the eyelets fell out or the uh, stitching was completely out. But unless you get something structural like that, if it were only some loose stitching you can burn off or some wayward handmade stitching lines, I'm okay with that. Sitting in Australia and spending some people's weekly wage, I'm not going to buy Truman boots every day. But if I'm looking for my sturdy pair that will last me a long time, I would truly give these a look. Would I buy them again? Yep, I would. So there you go. What did you think of my review? If you liked it, show some love and click on like. Um, overall, I like the sturdiness of these Truman boots. As a brand, I like that they settle on one good design and then they vary it on different lasts, uh, ch change it up with uh, different outsole combinations and use some very unique and interesting and rugged leathers. To me, the QC is good in that work booty handmade sense, you know. Uh, to me, they're a good fit, if not softly shock absorbing. But what do you want? 
um, you know, you can have sneaker-like boots or you can have tough boots. There's a place in the world for both. I actually don't have a totally bad thing to say about this pair. That's it then. Go on, click on like and subscribe. I deserve it. <laughs> and keep an eye out for more boot reviews coming your way. Until then, take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon.